Merci. L N T S Net Motley at six thirty PM W five FC.
Catherine, I need to make myself very clear. If we uplink now, Skynet will be in control of your military. But you'll be in control of Skynet, right? That is correct, sir. Skynet. Does anyone need to use the repeater before we begin the 9 p.m. Skynet? This is KF5PDF. My name is Billy, and I'll be your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Skynet is a weekly net called every Saturday night at 9 p.m. concerning the subject of astronomy. Our purpose is to help amateurs become more familiar with the nighttime and daytime sky, astronomy, and space in general. This net is open to all amateurs interested in this topic, and we encourage your participation, comments, and suggestions for this net. Stations with priority or emergency traffic may enter the net at any time by using the pro sign break break and your call sign. Is there any emergency or priority traffic? This is a directed net. Please do not transmit without direction from net control. That would be me. And stations are reminded to ID at the end of your transmissions. This weekly net operates on 146.880 megahertz with a PL tone of 110.9. Check-ins via echo link are also possible using the W5FC-R station ID and echo link node 37247. Tonight's topics, astronomy charts, pictures, and live audio video links are available online. Go to www.w5fc.org right now for the complete list. And remember to tell others about this popular net. All amateur operators are welcome. You need not be a member of any amateur radio club to participate. This net is 90 minutes long and is structured in several parts. General announcements, Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope, National Space Society events, discussion topic of the evening, what can you see in the sky tonight, a featured constellation or object or topic, recent astronomical discoveries, space exploration and space history, visible satellite passages over the next couple of days, astronomical Q&A, and our 73 round. All amateurs are licensed to tra that are licensed to transmit on this frequency are invited to check in. So at this time, I will turn the net over to my alternate net control, Tom, KE5ICX, if you will do the check-in honors, please. All right, Ms. Dewey, I'll do exactly that. This is KE5ICX. My name is Tom. I'm alternate net control this evening. I'll be doing check-in. 
So go ahead and take roll call or short time check-ins if you are either of those. Please come with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. Bravo November Papa Luis in forward. This is Kilo Golf Five Zulu Charlie K. 
Django, David, and Frisco. This is November 5, Yankee Echo Oscar, Steve, San Antonio. Four check-ins, and I got three. What I got three of them so far. I've got uh, K5 B and T. That's Luis. Got you. And I was having some trouble. I didn't write down from where, but I got you in. Uh, M5 Y E O. Stephen in San Antonio. K2 5 P. Mike over in Richardson. He's shy tonight, I think. Um, there was someone else. Uh, I missed someone. Uh, would you please again? And thank you all to, who joined us for Skynet. All right, so let's go ahead and get started with general announcements. So do we have any general announcements for this evening's net? These can be ham, astronomical, space, or of general interest to licensed hams. If so, please come now with your call sign. November Tango 5, Tango Mike. November 5, Bravo, Bravo, we double. Good evening. Uh, I heard you both, so we'll start with NT5TM. Good evening, Tony. What announcements do you have for us this evening? Thank you, Billy. It's been a fine day out there today. We had a up. I'd like to remind everyone those have started again for the year. The Dallas Amateur Radio Club Lecture and Lab is on the fourth Saturday of every month. Sometimes we have a lecture, sometimes we have a lab, sometimes we do both. Uh, this weekend we built multimeters. Yes, you could buy one, but you wouldn't learn how to put one together. Uh, we built our own multimeters today, and it was a fun event. If you'd like to listen to other nets tonight, or even check in and participate, we do have one more net. The Afterglow Movie Discussion is coming up at 10.30-ish tonight. We're going to be talking about the sci-fi dystopia from 1997, 
And there's more information on that in the Afterglow Movie Facebook group. If you head over to W5FC.org, you can see more information about all of this weekend's announcements, especially the big announcement from TechNet, which was a reminder that the Irving Ham Fest is coming up this coming weekend. That's one week from today. It's at the Betcha Bingo Hall out in Irving, Texas, 8 a.m. to about 2 p.m. It usually wraps up a little earlier on Saturday. Volunteers are still needed. You can use the contact us form at W5SC.org to sign up to help. You get free admission and a free door prize ticket. But if volunteering is not, you can buy tickets and buy raffle tickets uh, from a link to the Irving Ham Club website. This is a really fun, really friendly uh, flea market style ham fest. They have VE testing. You meet a lot of fun people, and it supports two of your favorite clubs, the Dallas and Irving Amateur Radio Clubs. Uh, so come on out. I'd love to see you. It's a great time. Uh, that's a week from today at Chibinga Hall in Irving, the Irving Ham Fest. This is NT5 TM. Great. Thank you, Tony, for those great announcements. All right, uh, next up is uh, Bill, N5BB. What announcements do you have for us this evening? And good evening. Billy, this is N5BB. Well, my announcement was going to be the Irving Camp Fest a week from today. So if you haven't been there before, to get there, uh, you can go down Highway 183 in Irving. This is the east-west highway that goes by the south entrance of the DFW Airport. And you want to exit Story Road and head south. And it's about a mile south of Highway 183 on Story Road. Uh, when you get a mile south, you'll go across to Irving Boulevard. This is a wide, uh, a big wide, this, uh, separated uh, street. Highway. And right after you cross Irving Boulevard, you're going to want to take a right into the bingo hall. The bingo hall is not right on Irving Boulevard, it's about a quarter of a block south of Irving Boulevard. Um, it's right across the street from the fire station there. Pretty much can't miss it. Any other questions, I'll be glad to help, to help you. This is N5BB. Great. Thank you very much, Bill. Does anybody have any questions or need any fills uh, before we move on? If so, please come now with your call. Does anybody else uh, have any announcements for this evening's net? If so, please come now. Not hearing any, so I'll go ahead with a few announcements of my own. The AMSAT Radio Amateur Satellite Group has two nets available to Dallas residents on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. Central Time. You'll need Echolink installed and be registered. You can find the net under Groups and AMSAT. Also, a live audio link is available on their website at www.amsatnet.com, and this net originates in Houston, Texas. The Dallas AMSAT Net, Dallas Fort Worth, Texas, is every Wednesday at 9 p.m. on the Arlington Repeater, which is 147.140 megahertz with a PL tone of 110.9 and a positive offset. The DARC has several Monday night nets. Uh, the first Monday of the month is Ham Fixin's Net, so if you uh, like cooking, uh, enjoy food, want to uh, give a recipe or listen to the recipes or have a question or anecdote about food, uh, that's what Ham Fixins is all about, and there's some great recipes that get shared. Um, the second Monday of the month is MCOM 101, Emergency Communications. 
The third Monday of the month is a second helping of Ham Fixin's Net. And fourth Monday is Geek Net. I uh, usually have all kinds of geeky news, news of the weird, brain teasers, uh, you name it. If it's geeky, we'll talk about it. And then also on a fifth Monday, there's a surprise net. So if the month has a fifth Monday, you'll be uh, pleasantly surprised by the goings-on on the surprise net. I've done everything from playing loads of rounds of Jeopardy to Truth or Lies, April Fool's, to Christmas Thunderdome, sharing best and worst Christmas presents, and I believe they did a build-your-own short story one time. So there's all kinds of fun going on on a fifth Monday. On Wednesdays, there's a veteran net uh, on first and third week from 7 to 8 p.m. And, of course, Saturday is the night of nets. Let's tech net from 7 to 8 p.m. And, of course, at 9 p.m., Skynet. The ARRL Net, National Traffic System Training Net, is also every night at 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And all are welcome to check in on any or all of these nets. Uh, so at this time, also as Tony mentioned before, uh, following Skynet, uh, we will have tonight's Afterglow Movie Net. So we always will decide on a movie and watch it during the week and then come back for the Afterglow Movie Net and discuss that movie. So at this time, I'll turn the net over to Tom, KE5ICX, if you will give us the details on tonight's Afterglow. Thank you very much, Tom, and we hope everybody will join us tonight after Skynet for the Afterglow Movie Net. All right, at this time, I'd like to see if there are any, uh, uh, this is the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas events, where and when you can look through a telescope. So uh, if there's anybody on frequency that would like to give information about the Texas Astronomical Society, please come now with your call sign. KF5JHA. KF5JHA. Chaz, good evening and welcome to Skynet. Uh, so, what information do you have for us this evening? Good evening, everyone. Actually, last night was the uh, meeting of the Texas Astronomical Society. Uh, that happens on the fourth Friday of each month, except for November and December. November is on the Friday before Thanksgiving, and in December there's usually some sort of holiday activities instead of the uh, Astronomical Society meeting. So for 10 months of the year, it's on the fourth Friday of each month, held at the uh, Learning Center, the Science Learning Center, on the campus of the University of Texas in uh, Richardson, uh, Dallas. Uh, so that's on Campbell Road. Starts at 7.30. Oh, 
also looking through a telescope that happens on almost every Saturday night. On the first Saturday night of each month, that would be the Star Geezer Star Party in Garland. On the second Saturday of each month, that would be the Frisco Star Fest. On the third one, that's the Cedar Hill Star Bowl. That's at Williams Park. And the Stars on the Rock is at the Shores. Now, that was supposed to take place tonight, even though it's clear, even though there's a lot of haze in the sky because the dust from the wind has been picking up. Uh, there was no star party tonight on Stars on the Rock because of the very wet conditions in the observing area. So, uh, does anybody have any questions or need any fills on that? Okay, I'll turn it back to net control. Thank you very much, Billy. Thank you very much, Chaz. And you can find out more about the Texas Astronomical Society of Dallas by going to their website at www.texasastro.org. It's on the website. You can click on the calendar and see all the events going on for any given month. And you can click on each event to see the details for that event so you can see what events are happening and what times and uh, make your decision to go from there. So there's always lots of fun events. All right, at this time, this is KF5PDS, your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Next up is National Space Society events. So at this time, I'll call on Bill N5BB to let us know what's going on with the National Space Society. This is in 5BB. Well, the last National Space Society meeting was on Sunday, February the 10th, and we had an astronaut there uh, at the meeting. So that was fun. Uh, the, ne the next local chapter of the National Space Society will be meeting on Sunday, March the 10th at 3.30 p.m. at the Spring Creek BBQ in Irving, corner of 183M Dalt Line. And I don't have the exact meeting topic yet for that meeting. Uh, the National Space Society today participated in the Brookhaven College STEM event, Science and Technology, Engineering and Math for kids. I was there along with two other local NSS uh, chapter officers, and we saw a lot of kids there at the Brookhaven uh, College event. And we saw Chad, who we know is an older kid. At least we think he's older. That's all I got in 5BB. Great. Thanks a lot, Bill. Yeah, getting to meet astronauts is always a pleasure and awe-inspiring. Uh, so if you ever have a chance to get to meet an astronaut and talk to them, uh, it really will be a life-changing event. So uh, glad that the folks that went to that meeting were able to meet an astronaut. So uh, glad to hear about that meeting. All right, so next up is the NCS topic. So uh, for those that have been tuning in during my uh, transmissions, uh, know that I've been covering the NASA analog missions. This is a multi-part ongoing presentation. And so tonight I'm going to pick up with the next mission on the list. So you can follow along with this information if you go to nasa.gov forward slash analogs. And you can find out more about the other analog missions that NASA is involved with and see where I'm at on the list and see what upcoming ones I have to talk about. About. And then you can go out and Google more information on other NASA pages. So uh, just to begin with, what is an analog mission? An analog is a situation on Earth that produces effects on the body similar to those experienced in space, both physical and mental emotional. And these studies help prepare us for long duration missions. NASA is associated with at least 15 analog missions throughout the world. So tonight I'm going to be talking about the IBMP 
ground-based experimental complex, or as known in Russian, uh, my pronunciation is probably not very good, but I'll give it a try, Nazemny Experimental Complex, or NEK. So a mission overview, the NEK uh, complex is located in Moscow, and this is a ground-based analog uh, which is a complement to human research being conducted on the International Space Station, such as Scott Kelly's one-year mission. These missions are paving the way to learn how the human body reacts in unique environments. The environment for this analog is isolation, and the hazards that are tested are isolation, dark and light cycles, and distance from Earth. Uh, there have been two current missions, uh, the Sirius missions, uh, Sirius 17 was started on October 2nd, 2017, uh, where a contract was signed between IBMP and KBR Weil on behalf of NASA's Human Research Program for cooperation in a 17-day isolation mission titled Sirius 17. This study began on November 7th, 2017, and was the first in a series of isolation studies of various durations at the NEK complex, and this was concluded on November 23rd. Sirius 18 and 19 will be four-month missions beginning in the fall of 2018. It will have an international crew and will be evaluating team dynamics in an isolation environment. So the title of the International Science Program for Isolation Study Series is Integrated Study of Adaptation Processes Occurring in Human Body during simulation of specific factors of spaceflight in an isolated habitation facility. And the principal partners are IBMP and NASA HRP. So some information about the Sirius program. So it says, before humans will go to Mars, NASA has practiced missions on Earth. And the Sirius missions are the latest spaceflight analogs NASA is utilizing to help us understand the risks of travel further into the solar system. This ground-based analog is a complement to human research being conducted on the International Space Station, as I mentioned, Scott Kelly's one-year mission. These missions are paving the way to learn how human body reacts in unique environments. So an analog environment is a situation on Earth that produces effects on the body similar to those experienced in space, physically, mentally, and emotionally. And these studies are expected to help advance human space flight from lower Earth orbit missions into deep space exploration. NASA, again, as I mentioned, is associated with at least 15 analog missions throughout the world. The Sirius analog takes place at the Institute for Biomedical Problems, which is IBMP, in Russia. Other NASA-associated analogs are in Germany, Canada, Antarctica, and sites in the U.S. In the Sirius missions, Sirius standing for Scientific International Research in a Unique Terrestrial Station, these are the first time NASA's Human Research Program partners with Russia's IBMP ground-based experimental complex, or NEK, to conduct a series of analog missions. The first of these was Sirius 17, uh, which was named because of its 17-day duration. So the Sirius 17 mission, from a NASA perspective, is designed to test capabilities of the Russian facility. They wanted to exercise the facility capabilities mission planning and integration procedures to identify challenges or issues now as opposed to during a longer duration mission. The goal with the IBMP to conduct at least three follow-on missions, a four-month mission in 2018, an eight-month mission in 2019, and a 12-month mission in 2020. So Sirius 17 has six human participants who will be isolated and confined in a mock spacecraft habitat for the mission's duration. 
and during the mission, it performed a suite of scientific experiments. So one of the reasons that NASA chose the Russian facility is that it is a dedicated facility. This means that during the missions, its purpose is to execute the simulated space missions and research activities targeted for an isolation environment. Also, they've done successful long-duration isolation missions at the IBMP facility in the past, even up to 520 days. They have demonstrated the ability to do the type of missions uh, work that NASA was planning to do. So uh, Lisa Spence is the Flight Analogs Program Manager. So more than 40 scientific experiments have been selected for Sirius 17, which uh, placed significant demands on crew time. So the HRP personnel developed a un unified science requirements document, which helps in the development of mission timeline and maximizes the science data capture. NASA's Human Research Program, or HRP, is dedicated to discovering the best methods and technologies to support safe, productive human space travel. HRP enables space exploration by reducing the risks to astronaut health and performance using ground research facilities, the International Space Station, and analog environments. This leads to the development and delivery of a program focused on human health, performance, and habitability standards, countermeasures and risk mitigation solutions, and advanced habitability and medical support technologies. HRP supports innovative scientific research by funding more than 300 research grants to respected universities, hospitals, and NASA centers to over 200 researchers in more than 30 states. And just some more information uh, about the NEK facility. The NEK provides an analog platform of four experimental chambers of 50 cubic meters, 100 cubic meters, 150 cubic meters, and 250 cubic meters that support three 10 crew members. Studies completed at the NEK required confinement in a stable environment provided by local life support systems, gas composition, temperature, humidity level, light, etc. Studies are conducted over a long duration of time to examine the effect of isolation and confinement on the behavioral health of research subjects. Confinement in the Mars 500 project lasted 520 days. The Mars 500 project was an analog study with three missions conducted between 2007 and 2011 in preparation for an unspecified future manned spaceflight to Mars. The first mission was 14 days, followed by a 105-day mission. The final mission, which was intended to simulate a 520-day manned mission, was conducted by an all-male crew consisting of three Russians, a Frenchman, an Italian, and a Chinese citizen. The experiment yielded important data on the physiological, social and psychological effects of long-term close quarters isolation. NEK can be used for studies that investigate life support systems, space activities such as docking, working on the surface of another planet, medical countermeasures, crew performance and dynamics, crew autonomy, and consequences of condition and associated physiological stressors. So again, more information, you can go to nasa.gov forward slash analogs and click on this mission and others to read about the important work that NASA is doing with regards to analog missions uh, and to help us further our exploration of space. So this is KF5PDS, your net control for the DARC Skynet. All right, this time I'd like to call upon Tom, KE5ICX, if you will see if we have any additional check-ins, and then you have uh, permission to hand off the net to Chaz, KF5JHA, after you've collected some check-ins, and you can just pass the net directly over to him so he can perform 
his uh, program of What's Up. This is KFI PDS to KE5 ICX. All right, very good. What Billy said. So I'll take additional check-ins. Please come now with your call sign name, where you're transmitting from. This is... Bravo, number four, Mike, Foxtrot, India, WB4. M F I Ted Dallas Low Power This is Kilo Five Kilo Tango X ray Kelly and Quillen. Venus, which is normally the brightest thing in the sky other than the sun or the moon. 
Then to the right of Venus, you will find the planet Saturn. To the right of Saturn, you'll find Jupiter. In the early evening uh, sky, low in the west, you'll find the planet Mercury. As long as you have a clear western horizon. On February the 26th, Mercury is at its greatest eastern elongation. In other words, it's at its furthest angular distance away from the sun, which is about 18 degrees. This makes Mercury a little bit easier for us to see. Mars is the pale orange object that's about halfway up in the western evening sky. There are around one to two million asteroids just in the asteroid belt between Jupiter and Mars. There's other asteroids throughout the solar system. Some of the asteroids orbit in a much more stretched out orbit, coming close to the Earth and then retreating back further into the solar system. But we've identified about 2,000 asteroids that could possibly hit the Earth uh, sometime within the next few years. Most of them are small. On March the 4th, the Earth will have an asteroid visitor that comes almost as close to the Earth as Mars. This is what we call a close approach, or close call. This is the asteroid 2015 EG. This asteroid is about 100 feet across and will be traveling at 9.6 kilometers a second. Okay, if you want to translate that, that's about 21,000 miles an hour. If something that size hits the Earth at that it won't cause a lot of damage, but it could damage several buildings, even might be on a few blocks. Let's see. Uh, but it would not be an extinction level event like what happened 65 million years ago when an asteroid between 10 and 50 miles across hit the Earth, and we believe that's the cause of the death of the dinosaurs. Now, not too long ago, in February the 15th, 2013, just over the town of, okay, uh, Billy, I'm having a hard time with Russian, too. Uh, Chayuping, Russia, the meteor, or possibly a small asteroid, ran into the Earth's atmosphere at a speed of 40,000 miles per hour, and it was about the size of 65 feet across. It exploded as it entered the Earth's atmosphere. The shock wave broke out thousands of windows. Yes, windows missing in a Russian winter pretty cold, and flying glass injured about 1,500 people. If you'd like to get more information on asteroid 2015 EG or any other close approaching asteroid, check out the website www.spaceweather.com. I'll be informing you here on Skynet if I notice any predicted close encounters of the asteroid kind. from the evening sky, uh, let's talk uh, briefly about what constellations you can see. Rising higher each night in the northeastern sky, you can find the Big Dipper, which is part of the constellation of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. Uh, now, wait a minute. Uh, the mascot for Berkhaven Community College is the bear. Uh, go Bears! Uh, okay, uh, back to the Big Bear in the sky. So some draw the Big Bear with the handle of the Big Dipper being the tail of the bear. So the Big Bear is rising nose first. Now, to the left of the Big Bear is the Little Dipper, which is part of the Little Bear Ursa Minor. Ursa Minor and the Little Dipper are famous for having our current North Star Polaris. Polaris may be difficult to find in the city because it's shining at only a magnitude of two. It is the 49th brightest star in the sky. But Polaris does pretty much stay within a degree of true north every night, all night. Now, Polaris is easier to find if you find the Big Dipper first. That's why I talked about that first. Take the two stars on the side of the bowl of the Big Dipper, opposite side of the handle, and draw a line from the bottom star in the bowl, called Mirac, to the star to the top of the bowl, called Dubi, Keep on drawing that line until you run into Polaris. Polaris is the end star in the handle of the Little Dipper. It's also the end star in the tail of Ursa Minor. 
Now, to the left of Ursa Minor, you'll find the constellation of Cassiopeia. Cassiopeia, right now, looks like the letter E in the evening northwestern sky. Cassiopeia represents the queen sitting on her throne. Turn around and face south. Orion can be found looking high in the south for three stars of equal brightness in a straight line and evenly spaced. This is the belt of Orion. There are two bright stars the, above the belt representing Orion's shoulders. The brighter one on the left is Betelgeuse, or Betelgeuse, and the other one on the right is Bellatrix. Two bright stars below Orion's belt form Orion's knees. The one on the left is Sias, the one on the right is Rigel. Now, using Orion's belt, drawing down and to the left, will run into the brightest star in the sky, other than the sun, and it's called Sirius. It is a doggone good star. Okay, I hear some of you laughing out there. Uh, because it's called the Dog Star. Sirius is in the constellation of the big dog. Venus Major. So you go back to Orion's belt and draw a line from the belt stars up and to the right, you should run into the brightest star of Taurus the Bull. We've talked about Taurus recently. That bright star is called Aldebaran. If you keep on going in the line, you just a little bit more, you'll run into a little group of stars, a cluster of stars. It's an open cluster called the Pleiades, or the Seven Sisters. In Japan, they call it Subaru. Well, I get you through some of the bright constellations of stars that are visible in the evening sky from the city. Now, do any of you out there in the radio land have any questions for me to fill on any information, or do you have just a general astronomy question? I don't know everything, but I may know the answer to your question. Come down. Hearing nothing, this is Chaz, KF5JJ, and that's it for What's Up for this week. I'll give this back to Net Control Billy. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you very much, Chaz. This is KF5PDS, your Net Control for this session of the DARC Skynet. Always exciting to hear about What's Up. All right, so up next is our featured constellation. So at this time, I'd like to remind you that you can go to w5fc.org to follow along with sky maps and images. Uh, and if you have Facebook up, you could also watch uh, Facebook. Uh, Tom usually does a great slideshow that goes along with the presentation. So I uh, just want to remind you that you can follow along. So at this time, I will turn the net over to Carolyn, KC5OZT. The net is yours. Thank you. This is KC5OZT. And tonight's constellation is Catcher the Crab. It's the faintest of the 12 zodiac constellations. And it's the 31st largest constellation in the sky, so it's pretty small. In mythology, it's associated with the crab in the story of the 12 labors of Hercules. If you may remember that in the myth, Hera sends a crab to distract Hercules while he's fighting Hydra, the serpent. And the crab tries to kill Hercules. Uh, one story goes, Hercules kicks it all the way to the stars. In another version, the crab gets crushed, and Hera places it in the sky for its efforts. However, she puts it in a region of the sky with no bright stars because the crab was not successful in accomplishing the task.
1609, and Messier added it to his catalog in 1769. It contains at least a thousand stars, and more than half of them are red dwarfs. About a third are sun-like, uh, F, G, and K class. Brightest stars are blue, white, and color, and the magnitude range between 6 and 6.5. And uh, we also have another nice open question. M67, magnitude 6.1, is one of the oldest open clusters known discovered by uh, the German astronomer Johann Kohler, and it contains over 100 stars similar to the sun, number of red giants, and almost all of the stars in the cluster are at roughly the same distance and the same age, and this makes it one of the most observed and studied objects by those studying stellar evolution. And our final object, the uh, NGC 2775, it's a spiral galaxy, but it's about magnitude 11. Uh, it was discovered by Herschel in 1783. It has multiple spiral arms and uh, has some regions which mean there was recent star forming activity occurring in it. So if you have a big enough scope, uh, I mean, look for it, but the uh, cancer of the crab is small, but it has some uh, pretty fascinating uh, stars and objects, so look at it. Uh, and uh, unless there's any questions, uh, Billy, I'll turn it back to you. Bye, Great, Carolyn. Does anybody have any questions for Carolyn before we move on? If so, please come now with your call sign. All right, not hearing anything, so at this time I'll turn the net over for recent astronomical discoveries to Brenda, WB5OZL. The net is yours. Walter, 
with all this, now we know that the little piece of sodium got left behind, and we see it today at Hippocamp. The orbits of the two men are now 7,500 miles apart. a large region of icy and rocky objects beyond the orbit of Neptune. Triton's gravity has torn up Neptune's original satellite system. Triton settled into a circular orbit as the debris shattered Neptunian, Neptunian moon recoalesced into a second generation of natural satellites. However, comet bombardment continued to tear things up, leading to the birth of Hippocamp, which might be considered a third generation Based on estimates of comet populations, we know that other moons in the outer solar system have been hit by comets, smashed apart, and re multiple times. Noted Jack Lazar of Madison Ames Research Institute um, Center in California, Silicon Valley, a co-author of the new research. This pair of satellites provides a dramatic illustration that moons are sometimes broken apart by comets. And we have 
Brenda, this is KFI's PDS, your net control for this session of the DARC Skynet. All right, at this time, uh, we'll uh, go to space exploration and space history. So at this time, I will turn the net over to Tony. And the net is yours. Thank you, Billy. It's been a big week, both in the present and in history. Uh, the Peregrine Falcon has bumped into the Dragon Palace. Uh, that is to say, Hayabusa 2 uh, did touch briefly the asteroid Ryugu. Uh, they were still waiting for confirmation, which may take several days, for whether any sample has been collected, and if so, how much. But they can't measure that directly. They have to make little motions of their probe and measure how much its moment of inertia has changed. Uh, so that may or may not be available yet, but uh, it's very cool. It's an amazing project. Uh, both NASA and the Japanese space agency JAXA are engaged in collecting material from asteroids, and uh, Hayabusa 2 is doing well. That's the first of three sample collection attempts it's going to make, and I wish well for all three. Uh, on another note, uh, thanks to a launch from SpaceX and the work of a private foundation, in Israel, uh, the first ever privately funded lander for the moon, Bereshit, is on its way. Unlike many moon landers, which seem to get there in between two and three days, uh, this is going to take about eight weeks, because this was actually a small, lightweight, kind of parasite or follow-along payload, uh, riding along with satellites that were in G-synchronous for orbit. Uh, so using a very minimum amount of thrust to put it in an orbit that slowly gets higher until eventually the moon's gravity will grab a hold of it and pull it in. So it's not a direct flight like Ranger or Apollo uh, or Lunar Orbiter or any of the more familiar ones. It's a very careful, very minimum energy transfer. Uh, and hopefully, Barry Sheep will get there and do some interesting science. If you're like me, you went to Scotland school or you're going to go a little later in the season, lots of them are storm spotters. We watch the weather, we worry about protecting our community, but we don't know much about the weather on Mars. Well, that can help with that. The InSight Lander, among many other jobs, has the first ever publicly available weather station on Mars. It reports the wind speed and direction, temperature and pressure, just like your weather station at home. NASA didn't really do this to provide information 
mission to Skywarp spotters. It's to help subtract the effects of weather gusts and winds and changes in pressure uh, from the seismometer that the probe has carried to the surface of Mars. This instrument is so accurate that things like gusts of wind could easily swamp these signals it's looking for. So these uh, meteorological conditions have to be carefully measured and subtracted out. You know, it's a lot of fun, even separate from its scientific value, to think about what we would have to wear if we were putting on our oxygen mask and leaving the tunnels of our habitat. Is it warm and close to freezing, or is it nighttime and pretty inhospitable? Of one, or is it two space related birthdays to celebrate this week? On February 31st, 1964, one astronaut, or is it two, was born? Mark and Scott Kelly, identical twins, the only siblings ever to both fly in space, uh, were born in Orange, New Jersey. Uh, they participated in shuttle flights and ISS operations, including a remarkable long term study. Uh, carefully taking uh, DNA samples from both of them to measure different expression between an astronaut in space and a similarly conditioned and trained and genetically identical person who was still on the ground. Aaron said that's pretty cool because we know a lot in general about the effects of space flight on human physiology with you know the puffiness in the face and uh, osteoporosis and other risks, but the details of how these effects happen are largely unknown. So this was a really unique opportunity uh, to find out exactly what makes these changes tick in the human body. In February 18, 1930, Kai discovered what used to be a planet I say sadly. That is, he just started Pluto using a fun instrument, the Blink Comparator. Uh, back in 1906, Percival Lovell, a wealthy Bostonian who'd found, founded his own observatory out in Highstaff, started an extensive and expensive project to search for a possible life planet, Planet X. There were several su supposed coordinates where Planet X might be, but no one knew exactly where to look. Uh, when Lowell died in 1916, his widow, Constance, wanted the money back. She was, well, not interested in astronomy out in uh, Flagstaff and uh, was more interested in living well back in Boston. After a 10-year legal battle, the observatory reclaimed the money and resumed its search for Planet X in 1929. And uh, the observatory director, astronomers used to have these cool names, Vesto Slipher, uh, gave the job of locating Planet X to 23-year-old Clyde, Ta Clyde Tombaugh, who had been hired because of his astronomical drawings. It turned out that several survey pictures had photographed Pluto as early as 1915, uh, but it was not until March, of, excuse me, on January and February 1930 uh, that Tombaugh realized something was up. And especially on February 18, 1930, he made the discovery image of Pluto. He saw a moving dot on the photographic plates. But now Constance was not forgotten uh, because although she did have to give the money back to the observatory, she tried to insist that the planet be named Constance after her. Uh, this proposal was widely ignored by the astronomical community. On February 20th, 1962, Scott Carpenter said his famous words, Godspeed, John Men. Mercury 06 was the third human space after those of Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom in the U.S. project Mercury. Uh, it was not, of course, the first orbital space flight by a human that had been done by Yuri Gagarin and German Titov, uh, but it was the first orbital space flight by a U.S. astronaut. The launch had been previously delayed by bad weather and then due to a leak. Uh, 
Tiny Ellis Booth, uh, which had caused a two-week postponement. Well, they investigated it and they can repair other missing, well, dysfunctional parts. is just a tremendous amount you can learn about this flight. It's one of the most documented in NASA history with lots of reports and everything from the changes in Glenn's vision uh, to all of the telemetry and tracking facility, all available online. Uh, if you only have time to watch a small part of the Ray Long movie, The Right Stuff, the part about Glenn's flight is probably the most entertaining and riveting section. Uh, it often quotes Glenn's uh, communications exactly, and it's worth the time. Over the Indian Ocean, Glenn observed the first sunset from orbit on his flight. He observed the twilight was very beautiful, and the space uh, sky was, of course, completely black. As the sun rose, Glenn saw thousands of little specks, brilliant specks, floating around the capsule. He called them fireflies. For a moment, he felt the spacecraft was tumbling, or that he was looking into a moving star field. Uh, as a good pilot, he looked out the window, looked at the Earth, checked his instrument, uh, and dispelled the illusion. Uh, he even tried banging on the spacecraft to see if the space uh, fireflies were coming from the shingles or the window. Uh, Glenn was also troubled by the infamous retropack situation. A faulty indicator said that the landing bag, a cushioned fiberglass and rubber bag underneath the spacecraft, which was between the heat shield and the spacecraft, had deployed while the spacecraft was in orbit. Notice why I said it was between the heat shield and the spacecraft. He needed that heat shield if he wanted to re-enter. Uh, they had him keep the re retro rockets, which were held by straps, fastened to the bottom of the spacecraft after using them instead of jettisoning them. Fortunately, it was just, as I mentioned, a faulty switch. There was nothing wrong with holding the retro pack on, uh, but no real reason to do so. It's worth noting, and actually I'm going to get into this a little bit more during our afterglow movie discussion at 10.30, being an astronaut was by no means the only way to participate in the Mercury program. About 30,000 people, depending on which estimate you follow, were involved in Mercury Atlas 6. About 15,600 of them were involved in the recovery effort. There were lots of zones in which Glenn might have landed if his spacecraft got into trouble. About 2,600 were involved in the launch, and about 1,100 were involved in the worldwide tracking network, the first of its kind in the world. During Soviet spacecraft flights, they'd had to, well, send radiograms. Yes, just like what you hear on the National Traffic System. There was no real-time network for telemetry. Uh, people with antennas and very... One at Gagarin spacecraft jotted down numbers and radiogrammed them back to the launch complex. Uh, NASA had none of that, no patience for that at all. Uh, they in installed hundreds of thousands of miles of telephone, telegraph, and teletype wire uh, to power 18 tracking stations around the world and collect data from the spacecraft in as near real time as possible. Uh, so you really don't have to be an astronaut. You can be involved in space flight uh, even as an IT professional, which I think is pretty cool. One of our pet birds uh, I think the bird hasn't flown in space yet. I don't think it knows about a vacuum. Uh, Ranger 8 did know about vacuum, though. This was our second probe to reach the moon and hit it. It went kaboom, but the kaboom was on purpose. This was a lunar probe mission. Before we could orbit the moon, we had to get there. The Ranger probes, well, mostly exploded or burned up in the Earth's atmosphere, but starting with Ranger 7, they hit the moon, and that's what they were supposed to do. As they got closer, they transmitted high-resolution pictures of the moon's surface. Ranger 8 was especially important because it was aimed at the Sea of Tranquility, which you might remember from Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. Without the Ranger probes, we would have known a lot less about the moon's surface and Apollo landing site selection. The boom this week was not on February 21st, 1969. The first attempt to launch a Russian one moon rocket ended in a horrible cataclysmic failure. The CORD, K-O-R-D, engine control system, 
uh, turned off all of the engines in all of the rocket stages, resulting in this giant rocket collapsing back to Earth about 68 seconds after launch and blowing up a big section of entry empty desert in Kazakhstan. I'd like the next complex. Uh, Cord was, well, kind of dysfunctional. It didn't handle the situation well, but to its limited credit, the situation was tough. Many of the plumbing joints on the first stage of the booster had never been tested. The Soviets weren't big on engine testing, and they failed one by one during the this resulted in several fires near the base of the first stage of the rocket, which burned through control wiring, uh, and none of the control systems were designed to cope with that sort of failure. So Ranger 8, good kaboom. N1, L1, bad kaboom. Uh, but that's this week in space history, and I'm NT5 Tia. Great, thank you very much, Tony. This is KF5PDS, your net control for the DARC Skynet. All right, um, we're getting close to time, so I'm just going to give some brief information about satellite passages and just let you know that you can go to the website www.heavens-above.com uh, to find out what's in orbit and where to look during flyovers. So you can go to this web page, you can put in latitude and longitude uh, for your location or choose the city and set it for your location so that you can get the most accurate information about flyovers and visible satellite passages for your location. So again, that website is www.heavens-above.com. So at this time, I'll turn the net over to Tom, KE5ICX, one last time to see if we have any final check-ins and get a final count for the number of participants. So this is KF5PDS to KE5ICX. ICX. My name's Tom. I'll take final check-ins now. If you'd like to be added to the list, we'd like to know if you're out there listening. Uh, please come now with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. So Echo 5, Romeo Foxtrot, Zulu, Darwin, and Garland. You're last, but certainly not least, uh, least uh, Darwin. I've got Kilo Echo 5, uh, Romeo Foxtrot Zulu over in Garland. Uh, so I have a total of 22 check-ins this evening, uh, Ms. Billy. This is KE5 ICS. Thank you, Tom. Copy that we had tonight. We had 22 hams participating on the air. So thank you to all who checked in this evening. We hope you'll join us here next week and every Saturday night at 9 p.m. to discuss astronomy, space, and space exploration. On this net, the sky is never the limit. We're always looking for net control stations for this and all the other DARC nets. If you would like to try your hand at this, Contact any of the net controls by sending an email to nets at w5fc.org. You can follow topics and discussion about this net and astronomy in general on Facebook and Twitter, as well as our audio and video streams, video archives, and other useful internet resources by going to w5fc.org at the conclusion of this net. So until next Saturday night, this is KF5PDS, Billy, and I'll be closing the net at 2228 local time and returning the repeater to normal amateur use. So 7-3 everyone and enjoy the evening discovering the universe. And don't forget, following this net, uh, we'll usually take a five minute break and come back for the Afterglow movie net 
where we'll be discussing the movie of the evening, Gattaca. So, 7-3, everyone. All my circuits are functioning perfectly. Afterglow movie net.
five ICX saying one need to use the repeater before we begin the afterglow moving act. Okay, so what is this net? Well, we watch a movie, sometimes a good one, many times a really bad one. You always science fiction, although every once in a while we break away from that and do something a little different just because we can. So what we do is we go ahead and select the movie each week. Uh, this is available at the Afterglow movie uh, group over on Facebook. That's Afterglow. The first word movie is the second word. Go ahead and ask to sign up there if you're not a part of it. Or if you're not a Facebook-type fan, uh, we'll send you an email with whatever the movie is, which is, send it to me, Kilo Echo 5, India, Charlie X-Ray, KE5ICX, at Yahoo.com. Say you'd like to be added to the list, and I'll put you on there. And if the movie is available for free, uh, I'll send you a link as well. Uh, we try and do that or find services that... Uh, support uh, the movies, usually with advertising or something like that. Occasionally, we even go on a field trip. We haven't done any yet this year, but we probably will. And then we'll talk about the movie a week later. So the movie that we're uh, going to talk about this evening, and I'm going to go ahead and read a little synopsis before we do the check-in, because you may have seen it and may remember this film uh, quite a bit and would like to talk about it, even though you haven't seen it recently. The rest of us probably saw it in the last few days. So this is what it is. Gattaca is a 1997 American science fiction film written directed by Andrew Nicole. It stars Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman uh, with Jude Law, Warren Dean, Ernest Borgnine, I think it was his last film, Gore Vidal, yeah, that Gore Vidal, and Alan Arkin appearing in supporting roles. The film presents a biopunk version of the future society driven by eugenics, where potential children are conceived through genetic uh, selection to ensure they possess the best hereditary uh, traits of their parents. The film centers on Vincent Freeman, played by Hawk, who was conceived outside the eugenics program and struggles to overcome genetic discrimination to realize his dream of going into space. The film draws on concerns over reproductive technologies which facilitate eugenics and possible consequences of such technological developments for society. It also explores the idea of destiny and the ways in which it can and does govern lives. Characters in Gattaca continually battle both the society and themselves to find their place in the world and who they are destined to be according to their genes. The film's title is based on the letters G. A, T, and C, which stand for guanine, uh, andinine, thymine, and cyst cystine, and the four nucleobases of DNA. It was a 1997 nominee for the Academy Award for Best Art Direction and the Golden Globe Award for Best Original Score. The film flopped in, at the box office, but it received generally positive reviews and has since gained a cult following. All right, the plot in this one is a little bit uh, long, so I'm going to just read a couple of paragraphs here. I did extensive research by going to Wikipedia and reading what you're hearing now. So here's the plot, or at least part of it. In the not-too-distant future, libertarian eugenics is common. The genetic registry database uses biometrics to classify those so created as valid while those conceived by traditional means and more susceptible to genetic, genetic disorders are known as invalid. Genetic discrimination is illegal, but in practice, genotype profiling is used to identify valids to qualify for professional employment, while invalids, invalids are relegated to menial jobs. Vincent Freeman is conceived without the aid of genetic selection. His genetics indicate a high probability of several disorders and an estimated life of 30.2 years. 
His parents, regretting their decision, used genetic selection to give birth to their next child, Anton. Growing up, the two brothers often played a game of chicken by swimming out to sea, and the first one returning to shore considers the loser. Vincent always loses. Vincent dreams of a career in space travel, but is reminded of his genetic inferiority. One day, Vincent challenges Anton to a game of chicken and bests him before Anton starts to drown. Vincent saves Anton and then leaves home. Years later, Vincent works as an invalid, cleaning office spaces, including the Gattaca Aerospace Corporation, a space flight conglomerate. He gets his chance to pose as a valid by using hair, skin, blood, and urine samples from a donor, Jerome Eugene Morrill, who is a former swimming star paralyzed due to a car accident. When uh, Jerome's genetic, with Jerome's genetic makeup, Vincent gains employment at Gattaca and is assigned to be a navigator for an upcoming trip to Saturn's moon Titan. To keep his identity hidden, Vincent must meticulously groom and scrub down daily to remove his own genetic material and pass daily DNA scanning and urine tests using Jerome samples. And I'll read this final, uh, this one paragraph and we'll be done. Gattaca becomes embroiled in controversy when one of its administrators is murdered a week before the flight. Police fall find a fallen eyelash of Vincent at the scene. An investigation is launched to find the murderer, Vincent being the top suspect. Through this, Vincent becomes close to the co-worker Irene Cassini and falls in love with her. Though a valid Irene has a higher risk of heart failure that will prevent her from joining any deep space Gattaca mission, Vincent also learns that Jerome's paralysis is by his own hand after coming in second place in the swim meet Jerome threw himself in front of a car. Jerome maintains that he is designed to be the best, yet wasn't. And that is the source of his suffering. So I'm going to leave it there for now. So we'll go ahead and take check-ins at this point. So let's go ahead and do that. I will take check-ins over there, and then I will go to Echoing. If you'd like to join us this evening, please come now with your call sign your name, where you're transmitting from, and let me know if you saw the movie. November Tango 5, Tango Mike, Tony, low power portable in Dallas, I did see the movie. November 5, Bravo Bravo, Bill in Irving, I did see the movie. Charlie Five, Oscar Zulu Tango, Carolyn in Louisville, and I did see the movie. Kilo Golf Five, Whiskey Golf Hotel, Nick and Carolyn, I did see the movie. Kilo, Foxtrot Five, Tango, Sierra Kilo. Burrow and Dallas, I did see the movie. Whiskey 5, Echo, Bravo, Bravo, David and Dallas, yes, I saw it. NT5TM, Tony, in Dallas, yep, N5BB, Bill, Irving, yep, KC5OZT, Carolyn, Louisville, yep, uh, KC5WGH, uh, Nicholas, I, I hope I got your name right, Carrollton, yep, KF5TSK, Bo in Dallas, yep, W5EBB, David in Dallas, yep, um, any additional over there before I go to that link? NT5OZL, Brenda DeSoto. Okay, very good. I assume you saw the movie 
because we were discussing it while I was watching the movie over chat. All right. Let's go to Echo Link. Anybody over on Echo Link, uh, please come now with your call sign, your name, where you're transmitting from. Let us know if you saw the movie. This is Kill Go 5, Papa Mike, November, James in Fort Worth. I did see the movie. This is Kilo Foxtrot 5, Papa Delta Sierra, Billy and Sherman. Yes, I saw the movie. KG5PMN, James over in Fort Worth, yep. K5PDS, Miss Billy and Sherman, yep. All right, let's get started. Uh, I think everybody knows the rules here, and I think that the, uh, what we do is on the first round, we're going to go ahead and talk about plot. After that, we'll talk about characterization. After that, we'll probably talk about uh, everything else, music, music. Uh, the um, cinematography, all of that. So we're going to start with story. So we'll go to the top with NT5TM. Tony, you said this is one of your favorite films, or at least uh, you liked it a lot. Maybe not your favorite, I don't know. But tell us, what did you think about the story? As always, Aaron and I will both have lots to add when we talk about characters. I own this movie. I really liked it when it came out. I the basic story of sticking it to the man in this dystopia of rampant discrimination. Uh, but watching it last time, I really kind of flipped into the mirror world where everyone had a good tea. And I thought to myself, you know, this plot is really about an anti-hero. As Aaron mentioned to me, that this is really a deeply ironic movie because occasionally the forces of evil, by accident, are right. The protagonist really is a man who should not be an astronaut. In fact, he shouldn't be a pilot, private, pilot, private pilot. And in fact, I don't think I'd let him drive my car. He's blind as a bat. He's a narcissistic, chronic liar. He's incredibly selfish. And, well, he really is has suffering from a terrible heart problem that will kill him soon. You know, 20 minutes of modern exercise, leaving him throwing up and shaking and fibrillating. <laughs> He's a person of bad character. I mean, it's just a... It's wonderful that we see this Maverick triumph, triumphing over the kingship, but it's also questionable and kind of thought-provoking that I don't really want him to win because I don't want to be on a spaceship he's piloting because he's going to die soon. So I'll talk a lot more about the characters uh, just a little bit later in the next round, uh, but that's what I wanted to throw out there for the start is that although, I, yeah, I really have liked this movie, and I still think it's really fun and thought-provoking, and I really do fear uh, this sort of discrimination. Uh, employers love convenience. It would be easy to see this sort of plot being very plausible. I really wonder if this was meant to be heroism or if we're watching an anti-hero, if we're watching the triumph of bad over bad rather than good over bad. NC5 Tia. Wow. Poor guy. Man, I don't want to get a performance review from you, Tony. Next up, N5 TV, Bill. What do you think of the plot? This is a dystopian science fiction movie, so, you know, that's just the way it is. <laughs> it's supposed to raise issues, but make them uh, nice and pretty. Uh, 
So I liked the movie, but since we're talking about the plot, I guess I need to talk about some little things that happened in the plot. So there were a few things that I thought for a movie made in 1997 were a little weird. First, at one point they were talking about uh, the people who are going to be doing the research are being the Hoovers, and they also call them the J. Edgars. My guess is that anybody born in 1997 wouldn't have a clue who J. Edgar Hoover was. It's just so far in the past, it would be just impossible for them to really know. So this thing is in somehow in the near future. Uh, they should have been talking about J. Edgars and Hoovers. And as some reviewers have pointed out, that there are also a bunch of vacuum cleaners in it. But that's just, I think, a funny thing. So I, I think their use of the term J. Edgar and Hoovers was uh, anachronistic. Irene, Emma Thurman, gets this DNA printout, it's all rolled up in a in a tube, and it's a big long paper strip full of the actual characters, which I don't think would have possibly fit on even that long paper strip. They should, why in the world in nineteen ninety seven would they think about this? I mean at least they could have had a floppy disk or something. <laughs> to me that's very anachronistic. Nobody's gonna look at that big long strip of paper and it wouldn't fit on there anyway. So I think that was kind of a weird thing. Um, in the restaurant, there's a bunch of smoking going on. Even in 1997, this is getting kind of rare in the U.S. It's really going away. So they didn't think about the fact that nobody would be smoking in a restaurant in a few years. They missed that. Why is everyone in suits? Everybody is in suits. Normally in science fiction movies, they're all in, like, blue jumpsuits. But these are black suits. They're all formally dressed. They're walking around everywhere that way. Where did this come from? I don't know. A little bit crazy. I did like the fact that everybody was using electric cars. You heard them making the whirring noise, and you saw him at one point plugging it in to charge it. So they got that right. I didn't like the fact that in Eugene Jerome's house, uh, the one with the, the wheelchair, there was no elevator. He had to look at it, living in this fancy place and everything. Why did he have to pull himself up those stairs? Weird plot point. Why was the elevator in that fancy house? Or why didn't he live on a sixth level house? That was kind of stupid. Um, seeing this movie is kind of weird. Uh, some of the actors in it, Zuma Thurman, some other people, maybe think it's a pretty modern movie, although she was only like 26 or 27 when this movie came out. But some of the other uh, people in the movie were from previous generations. And looking at it makes me realize, man, this is not a 21st century movie. It's got Gore Vidal in it. It's got Ernest Borgnine. Um, and even Alan Arkin. But especially, like, Ernest Borgnine and Gore Vidal. Uh, <laughs> they were at the end of their careers. Anyway, I did like the movie, though. Uh, but it's kind of interesting that it lost so much money. Uh, I can see why it's a cold favorite, though. In 5 DB. Guys, very good, Bill. I think you gave us some meat to talk about uh, in, in the film as well. Uh, you, you picked up on some really good points. But I'll save my comments for later. kc 5 zt Mrs. Kellen, what did you think about the story, the plot? Did it hold up? Was it good? Was it bad? Tell us. Uh, overall, I like the movie. Uh, I know it has uh, some odd uh, uh, things. 
you you sort of feel sorry for the guy that wants to uh, uh well then achieve uh, going to the stars and yet uh, and he uh, certainly works hard uh, with your own help to uh, make it possible and uh, it was sort of intriguing what just what all these could do to uh, fool the uh, well uh, company but uh, but yet there's uh, you know some uh, touching moments too uh, and uh, so uh, overall uh, overall I liked it um uh, even with that, uh, H5OZT. Okay, very good. And we'll move along. This is KE5ICX, and I'm at control. We're talking about the movie Gattaca. We'll take additional check-ins in a little bit. KE5WTH, uh, Nick West, over in Carrollton. Uh, your thoughts on the pot, uh, on the pot, uh, on the plot, I'll get it right, plot, story, go ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I, th I thought it was interesting, I enjoyed the movie, um, but, uh, but yeah, the plot, though, uh, it was a little bit closer, it was kind of interesting, it seems like they're, uh, uh, they're pretty, uh, particular about things, and, and a lot of people looking for perfection and things like that, and it seemed like that their process is setting out. Uh, had quite a few imperfections in it, and that he was able to, uh, without any really uh, high-end tricks, he was able to get around this for a long time. Um, and they had a lot of their processes being dependent on humans, who turned out in some cases, like our doctor, uh, to be kind of secretly rude for him and letting him through. And that should have been something with all the technology and, and uh, successful space launches they were having, like every two hours of every day, that, that they should have had the technology to, to better handle them. Very good. We'll move on. KF, uh, KF5 TSK, Burl. What do you think of the plot? What's KF5 TSK? Well, I made a list of things I thought was wrong with the whole movie. Uh, you know, his desire is to go to Saturn. He doesn't know what's there or what's going on. He meets this beautiful woman, and it's like, I just want to go to Saturn. Uh, it, you know, uh, it, it doesn't matter that, you know, I've really fallen in love, but I'm going to Saturn. I don't know when I'll be back, but, you know, uh, that's just how I feel. Um, you know, it's strange that you can manip manipulate genes, but you can't fix them. 
I know you can't fix his vision, but it's like, uh, you know, if if you can make perfect people, somehow you you figure out how to manipulate it. It's almost like, you know, this whole thing is just uh, logically backward. Uh, uh, gene mutilation for a perfect physical body violates everything that you know we think that athletes uh, cannot do using a performance enhancing drug. Uh, if you're perfect, you know, do you really need alcohol? And yet, you know, multiple scenes of them going to a bar and it's like, uh, but the alcohol will mess up the, uh, you know, all of the tests. You can't, you know, it's like you can't drink. And it, it's almost like, you know, everything was athletic uh, performance. Uh, and everything that they did. Uh, strange they were testing blood and not DNA, and uh, I think that's what, you know, Gattaca was really about, uh, you know, DNA. Uh, that's all I have for now. Keep I have TSK back to that. Very good, Burl. Let's move on to David, W5EBB, plot, tell us. Genomics, eugenics, well, that can, that can become malgenics also, and that's explored as a plot element in, uh, in quite a few stories. Uh, the Isthmus of Dr. Mor uh, Do oh, I'm sorry, The Island of Dr. Moreau by H.G. Wells in 1896 is a good example. The mixing of animal and hu human DNA uh, DNA mixing seed even in agricultural crops generally isn't a good idea unless you're Monsanto and there's a profit to be made um, in Star Trek the next generation the masterpiece society is a good episode where genomics is also explored but from a slightly different angle from Gattaca in the masterpiece society it's a society of clones where each person is refined and engineered to fulfill a very specific role in society versus in Gattaca where it's it's expanding your possibilities by giving you the best genes possible, uh, opening your horizons and, and broadening uh, the possibilities. But in the Masterpiece Society, it's more about a very specific role. And so it, it, it kind of is an interesting point. Well, which is the more likely scenario? Which is the more advantageous for a society? Um, but so it's an interesting uh, contrast. Um, Interestingly, in the Masterpiece Society, there's also a pianist in that episode, just as in Gattaca, although he has ten fingers, not twelve. Um, now, as for the ethics of it, at least in Gattaca, they're not taking it to the extreme of uh, specific CRISPR gene editing, or at least it, it wasn't shown if that's what they're doing. They seem to be picking out the best of the best, filtering out those fertilized eggs with, with uh, filtering out those with defects or not having the greatest combination and selecting among the best of the best. Um, and Vincent explained to Anton, you want to know how I did it in their game of chicken? He says, I never saved anything for the swim back, uh, especially if he's too close to the other side. He committed to his destination, and he didn't consider going back or reverting to what he was or what he was expected to be. So instead of uh, fertilizing in the test tube, maybe it's the fastest swimmer that ought to win. But in general, the, the, the plot it could be summarized, the theme is there is no gene for the human spirit. Uh, but the movie is also very rich with the deep metaphor and allegory, both narrative and visual, some of which you may notice upon additional viewings or maybe after a span of 20 years of its initial release, which was my case. And finally, it's curious how a simple hair follicle can turn out to be such an adversary. In this case, that ended up being the root of this problem, an eyelash, specifically. W5EBB. Interesting. Thank you, David. WB5OZL, Miss Brenda Plot. Go ahead. Uh, well, let me start with 
was I really kind of enjoyed this movie. Just thought provoking and um, gives you something to talk about. Um, although the attack on premise that we're going to make you see perfect people is one of question. You think about uh, dog breeders as you get a more and more perfect specimen of a dog breed, you end up with a lot of problems that are not necessarily related to their, you know, their color or their ear size or whatever. It just seems to mess things up. Um, so I'd like to see a story where all this perfection somehow goes badly wrong. I didn't understand why the guy wanted to dress up in a suit climb into a tin can. Is he an astronaut or is he cargo? I just wasn't sure about that, but what the excitement was. And um, somewhere along the way, they cut out the human, the uh, sense of humor out of the human genome. Um, so such dour miserableness everywhere. Uh, there was no joy at all. And uh, so the perfect society has managed to kill something off, which I think is a little bit ironic. Alrighty, back to that. That'd be fun to know. KG5 PM in. Um, the plot, I, I'm glad I didn't pay money to see this at the movies. I thought the plot was kind of slow and long drawn out for what it amounted to. Um, there were several issues in the story that I had that I don't really agree with was the use of that finger, um, blood sampling off the finger and that finger, um, cover or whatever you want to call it and it seems like that would be rather obvious on him and drawing the blood that's not the way you draw blood you just don't stick somebody in the arm and draw blood like that they didn't use tourniquets and uh when they did the blood sampling they stuck the needle in the machine well don't really do that either anytime you use a needle you try to keep it covered up as much as possible to keep you from getting accidental sticks even back in the 79 um, and I just, you know, I'm glad I really didn't spend that much time watching the movie, but KG5 PM in. Back to the net. Okay, James. Hmm, we're a mixed bag this evening, but that's fine. That's what this is all about. K5 PDS. Miss Billy, your comments on plot. Oh, good evening. Yeah, um, I've always really liked this movie. It's very thought-provoking, and uh, <clears throat> so, so with the plot, you know, it's it's good. You know, it, it moves, and there's no lags really for me. You know, and the the kind of sterile feeling that everybody has towards each other. I know that kind of falls under character. You know, is uh, is very interesting because everything's become so clinical in this environment. Um, so everybody has these kind of bland uh, interactions, <clears throat> and uh, so I'll talk more about that, I guess, when we get to characters. But, you know, I just, for me, I thought the story moved along. It was always engaging, and uh, but, uh, some things that I kind of wonder about as the movie went on uh, was, you know, the murder of the flight director. It's like they placed so much faith, I guess, in in identifying people through DNA that they had no security cameras, you know. So to me it seems like that place would have lots of cameras and be, you know, with all this, it would have high security and surveillance. But I guess if they could monitor people through DNA, they, I guess, were overconfident in, in their uh, ability there that they didn't have any security cameras to scan surveillance to see who murdered the flight director. And so they had to go through all this lengthy DNA investigation to fig try to figure it out. 
um, when if they had just had a simple security surveillance system, they could have seen who did it. Um, or maybe it wouldn't have taken place in the first place if someone knew they were going to be under a surveillance camera and be monitored, uh, and maybe the act wouldn't have been committed in the first place. So that was something to me that kind of jumped out. Um, also, uh, when they go, the parents go to have their second son, and they do the go through what they call the quote unquote normal uh, way of, of conceiving a child, and they go to the the eugenics doctor, and he's describing all the things that he can do. He can remove diseases, but he could also remove you know, addictive tendencies and propensities to violence, and he could remove all these kind of, you know, subtle qualities, and it's like, how would you do that? It's like, I, I don't know, you know, the human genome, on, uh, if there's parts of that that could be manipulated to do that, that to me, even, you know, for not too distant future, seems a little far-fetched to me, but I don't, I don't have a biology background, so maybe it's not, but uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but to me, I just seemed a little out there, um, and I have some comments to make about that when we get to characters as well. Uh, and then I felt the film had kind of a cool, you know, almost you know, wanted to have like a film noir quality because they were in the suit. So to me, it had kind of a retro futuristic feel, uh, you know, with the suit uh, kind of harking back to like a 40s kind of feel, with the cut of the suit, and uh, Oh, I was going to mention something else, and now I forgot. But, you know, juxtaposed with the more futuristic elements of all the launches to space and the, the electric cars, um, it just, oh, and the J. Edgar Hoover reference uh, was kind of, you know, a retro, you know, anachronistic, but to be, I think they were going for maybe retro futurism there uh, with, with some of those anachronisms, you know, like the tube, you know, the, the pneumatic tube uh, uh, delivery system and things like that. I think they were trying to maybe go retro futuristic, you know, juxtaposing some elements from the past with the future. So that's the way I took those elements. And also, uh, in reference to the spiral staircase, that to me is symbolism for the DNA and uh, Jerome's struggle to climb it. Uh, just, even though his body was broken, he wanted to prove, he wanted to try to return to some normalcy because he used to you know, his bedroom was upstairs, but he wanted to uh, conquer the helix, so to show that he was still on top genetically, that's the way I took that, so I know um, it's hard to separate plot and character in this movie for, uh, because there's so much, there's symbolism there, so uh, those are things that struck me as the movie moved along, but uh, I really enjoyed the film, so with that, I'll return it to you, this is KFI PDS, back to Matt. All right, thanks. And this is KE5ICX. Uh, one of our regulars just checked in, N5IMS. I'll tell you what, I'll see if uh, I'll put them on the spot. JJ, uh, we're at the point where we're talking about uh, the storyline. You want to go ahead and give comments now? I'll give you extra time.
also caught quite heavily the film noir and the retro modernism. That's kind of a thing. I, I kind of like that visual stuff. The Avanti 2 vehicle was a, uh, the Italian car, uh, probably a repo. Repo, repo, reproduction, not a repo, although it could have been, are kind of expensive. Uh, that's kind of cool. And some of the other older cars and then the pneumatics and all that I really do play into it. It does have that film noir uh, feel to it. I think they're trying to uh, channel a little bit of, of uh, Blade Runner with that one. Uh, a little more subtle, but uh, the same thing nevertheless. And of course, Frank Lloyd Wright stuff helps to create the mood and the feeling to it. Uh, one of the things that was most disturbing and at the same time was really kind of uh, simplistic is exactly what uh, Billy mentioned, and that is the eyelash. I mean, this provides the absolute for everything uh, and, and is used uh, well, it, it, and today it is used, but it's used in context and, and trials and that as a part of it, although we know in, in Texas here there was some fake DNA results that ended up with people going to prison. So definitely can be a major issue in 1996. It had not yet emerged as that. So the misuse and abuse of that is quite a, a problem. The other thing is, is, and this is true with a lot of stories and a lot of movies today, and it was emerging at the time is, is that we're constantly under surveillance as people. And when you see that, you know, you can see the crime. You can see these things happen. We, we watch on the news and we actually see those items occurring, what are the, the, the crimes happening, uh, the incidents, all of that stuff just fully uh, exposed and available from multiple angles, from all the phones and everything. Uh, this movie did not predict the near future in exactly the way that we see it uh, today. But when you do that, that also prevents the story from forwarding. Uh, there's a lot of films, uh, many, many of the James Bond films, for example, uh, uh, are that way where you would expect, you know, monitors everywhere, but James Bond ma manages to noodle his way into the, and out of a situation because there's no cameras to be found anywhere. So I don't want to digress too much or go off, off point, but it does cause problems with the storyline with the future if there's none of that. And that is the part that really drives me nuts uh, with films as well. Uh, it's like the 555-1212 phone number that everybody calls to call their friend. It takes you out of the moment because it doesn't make any material sense. Okay, I'm going to stop now and ask if there are any additional check-ins at this point. I see uh, JJ's there, but I'll go ahead and give extra time. Anybody would like to check in and join us? We're talking about Gattaca from 1996, the movie. If, if you saw it or didn't, that's okay. If you want to talk about genetics, that's okay, too. But that's what this movie is about. Anybody, any additional check-ins, please come now. Kilo call five zombies who need jobs. Frank Flower Mound. Yes, I did see it.
off. He was so perfect. Um, why is he, uh, you know, a big lush drinking all the time? And why is he smoking like it's a bingo parlor? You know, that was a little bit weird. You know, why if he's so perfect, why does he have all these flaws, right? And then, you know, the fact that uh, we're all supposed to be astronauts in training, but they're in suits and uh, they're sitting in cubes like it's some kind of help desk. You know, that it's not any kind of... I don't remember that in, in the old days of the Gemini program. Um, what else? Uh, the, the turnstiles that stick in the finger. I'm sorry, that's not very sanitary. Uh, you can get a lot of nasty diseases, you know, a bunch of people going through like that, so that was kind of dumb. Uh, what else? So when the police chased them down now you know, that alley, and, you know, they ran, what, like about 50 yards, and then just kind of went into a recess in the wall, and the police just, they're all there, they just give up the chase, <laughs> you know, what the hell is that, they didn't even bother, that didn't make sense, like, as if they would have got away, right, oh, and then the, uh, I don't know, the, uh, the whole Howard Hughes thing about, uh, uh, you know, the, the jars of TV and the toenail clippings, you know, that kind of crap, that, that was, yeah. So yeah, the, the movie that was in with the lead in my pencil, so to speak. <laughs> That's all I've got. KG5 is going to end back to you. All right, thanks, Frank. You always got an interesting take on any film that we watch. Okay, uh, anyone else want to join? I'll go to... If you don't, if no one else, then I'm going to the top of the list about characterization. Anybody else? Please come now. All right, hearing none. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the top. Let's talk about characterization. I know Tony's got comments on this one. He seemed rather critical about the uh, on the first round. NT five T M Tony, let him have it. Sir, and you know the funny thing is, this is a movie that I enjoy. I find it very suspenseful and engaging. Uh, I, I bought a copy of it many years ago. I saw it when it first came out. I've always liked it. Uh, but it's it's love. It's love that lets me really see all the flaws so clearly and see how it could be made better. Uh, <laughs> Aaron didn't like it. Uh, of course, the production design is practically a, a character itself. We've all been talking about that during plot. Uh, the odd buildings, the cars, the music, the moody lighting, the retro future look. Uh, in, in some ways, that's the strongest character in the movie. Yeah, smoking everywhere like it's the 40s. They're all playing bingo. Uh, quite a character, really. Aaron did mention that this character has a flaw. We never really see any places they're comfortable. No comfy chairs, beds, sofas. Uh, these people are almost very tough, muscular folks who never like to relax. Probably Aaron's least favorite character and strongest group of comments was around Uma Thurman's character. Uh, she was a love interest, but that's really all she was, a foil. Uh, they both love space so much, but she accepts the consequences of her mild heart problem, uh, but he gets to go into space because, well, our protagonist is much more dedicated. He's covering up his much more serious problem. You know, and, and I've been reading a lot on, on space history lately. I've been working through the Columbia and Challenger uh, investigation for the Rogers Report and the Cape Report for Columbia, so they can talk about them with Skynet. And it's really been driven home to me. Just, you know, there's one astronaut and there's 10,000 people per astronaut in the space program, roughly. There is something to our protagonist horribly embarrassing if he could only be one of these brilliant engineers, if he were forced to be a rocket scientist instead of, well, spam in a can. So that was particularly striking to me that, you know, maybe he could contribute to the space program without being a narcissist who endangers the lives of others. Uh, yes, there is no gene for the human spirit, uh, but he has a horrible character flaw because there are reasons for some of these health requirements on astronauts and others like pilots. they not fair to the people the airplane might fall off. Yes, Aaron was especially unhappy.
lady with Uma Thurman's character, who I'm sorry, I can't even remember her name right now, she ever felt that this character did not even act like a real person. She's just there to admire our protagonist. If, as I joked to Brenda at lecture last day, if on our second date I slugged a cop, how is that relationship going to go? Are you going to take me home to meet your parents? As Aaron uh, asked me this evening, wouldn't that make Uma care, Curtis wonder the, about this whole society question, the whole sequencing system they live in? It shouldn't be possible for someone like that to have those sort of violent and impulsive tendencies. That should have been edited out of him. Even her, his grand reveal of, well, I'm even less healthy than you, but I'm an astronaut, uh, doesn't provoke any restaurant, doesn't make her sad or confused. Uh, she's just pleased to be stuck on the ground and supporting her hero, the man. We both had a, a lot of laughter over the discipline and teamwork needed on a, a space flight, but here he is, he's got secret contact lenses. What if he loses one in space? Everyone's going to go search through the spacecraft on the way to Titan looking for his missing contact. Uh, we don't know. But, uh, but yeah, the, the human characters were often very flawed. Aaron especially, though, loved the Jude Law character, the real uh, Jerome Morrow. Uh, thought he was going to engage him. They, they could have really given him more even to do and make him more interesting. Uh, so interesting characters, not necessarily people we like, uh, especially in Aaron's case, the Uma Thurman character, but great production design, NT5TM. Thank you, Tony. Next up, N5BB, Bill. Characterization. Oh, my. This is in for BB. Oh, my, Tony. I feel like I'm in a, a deep, uh, I mean, quicksand after listening to your description. Just can't pull myself out of it. I guess I don't, I don't know. The movie is this book, dystopian movie. So, um... Okay, we're talking about characterization, but I think when you talk about the mood, like Tom, I guess and both Tony have mentioned and other people, uh, the mood of the movie is very, in one sense, flat. Um, in general, people don't get real excited. They don't cry. They don't laugh. They don't smile. Uh, they don't make jokes. Um, there's one violent episode, very short. Um, they lie, um, hide their feelings. Uh, they're kind of dense. Uh, I don't mean dense as being stupid. I mean dense as being um, kind of stuck in a rut. They're they're not they're not open open people. They're, they're stuck in a rut. That's the best way of describing it. So, you know, if you think about it, one of the most stuck in a rut people is the Gore Vidal uh, character, director Joseph, or Yosef, who uh, is darn tootin'. He's going to get that mission up to the uh, up to uh, Titan, and he murders, although we don't see it, I wish we'd solve it that part, but they, they alluded to it, but they didn't show it anything about it. He, he murders the director, the previous director, and, um, but he's not, uh, he's not excited. They show him, you know, after he's been caught, he's not over there excited or not excited, he's just not saying anything. I don't know, it's it's a very dense movie that way. Um, it's, it's directed in a very interesting style. Uh, yeah, I think this, this has to do with the director. Because um, everything is so muted. Did you notice 
in most of the movie, the colors are all kinds of gray. They're black suits, dark things. You don't see people dressed in bright colors and red. The vehicles really are black and maybe pastels. Um, outside scenes are mostly at night. Think about even the scenes in the ocean. Most of them, a lot of it was in the night. Um, it's all dark. And I think that's on purpose. The, 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 the director was trying to put this, uh, Tom said, this uh, uh, noir kind of attitude, but this dark uh, emotional feel on the whole thing. There, there's a cap. There's an emotional cap on the whole thing. So you see people filing onto the spacecraft. Don't those look like the most unhappy? you've ever seen? Are they choking around on things? No. They're falling into the building. They're falling onto the spacecraft in their suits. They're sitting down, uh, not in astronaut kind of uh, uniforms with buckles and things. They're kind of sitting on a, a hard metal bench. As somebody said, there's no comfy chairs in the, um, in the spaceship. And they're closing this utilitarian metal door all, you know, solid metal and locking them in there. It's like they're, they're committing them to, to some horrendous situation. You know, what's exciting about going up there to, uh, to Titan? Uh, no one seems to be happy about it. So it's just, it's a very weird movie emotionally. I can see why Tony did not like that, but I think the director wanted that. I think I think he purposely had this. I think that's why it's my favorite. It, it, the movie has this, this uh, original tinge to it uh, that's so different from our regular world. Okay, let's see characterization. Um, Vincent Jerome, Ethan Hawke, uh, was a prevaricator. He lied something. We don't know exactly why he wanted it. Um, <laughs> I, I didn't see pictures of Titan. Did you? I didn't see him being all that interested in astronomy and things. Did you? Why did he want to go into space? He looked at the rockets going up, but that was just the rocket shooting off. Nobody really talked about Titan, which was very strange to me. If he wanted to go to Titan, why wasn't he excited about what, what was he going to do on Titan? Do we get any idea of what he was going to do when he got there? I think he was going to be a navigator. <laughs> Did you see much evidence of that? No. The only thing was when he was out in the ocean near the end, he looked up at the stars to figure out how to navigate to get back to the shore. But that was the only evidence attending navigator. So uh, that was really weird. Why did he want to go to Titan? Um, I had talked about Gore Vidal's director, Joseph. Uma Therma as Irene, um, her emotions were all real smothered down. And... Um, I don't know. Everybody was so fettered. Nobody had, it's like nobody had free will in this whole thing. It's like their lives were scripted. Does that make any sense? It's like their lives were scripted. Her life was scripted. She walked around very stiffly. She did what she was expected to. It was uh, one of those kind of movies. Um... And Jude Law as Jerome and Eugene, he was a real piece of work. Um, he, he, evidently, he lost some swim beat. He purposely tried to kill himself. He didn't succeed and simply uh, was a paraplegic. And then it ends the movie, for no real reason, he kills himself. Um, I don't know. This is a very dark movie. I still like it for an experience. 
but I don't like it for being a fun movie, okay? It's not a fun movie. That's the last word I have about the characterization. It's I B. Very good, Bill. Uh, excellent comments. I thought it was quite fascinating, uh, a lot of the comments you made. Uh, this is KE5 ICX. Let me try that again. This is KE5 ICX. We're talking about the movie Gattaca uh, from 1996. So we're going to go down the list. KC5 OZ team. Ms. Carolyn, your thoughts on characterization? I agree with a lot of the about uh, you know uh, everybody just acting like dressing alike and all that, but it seems like that makes the uh, main characters stand out a little bit. Uh. And, of course, the main character um, wanting to go into space, uh, he, he, you know, uh, devotes his all so much trouble to pose to be able to do that. So that means he really wants to. Uh, and, uh, yeah, you know, the sermon, uh, she helps, but you don't feel like she really uh, <laughs> uh, loves him or anything. And uh, let me reset. But, uh, there was right at the end when that uh, final tester really, uh, realized. Invalid, and yet because his son was apparently invalid too, he he covered up for him, and let him go ahead, and that was sort of touching, and and uh, it was grim, but uh, you know after he was Jerome Cook, the real Jerome. Uh, um, set himself on fire, well, that is to protect, I guess, um, his friend, you know, that's getting to fulfill his uh, dream, so uh, that was why he set himself on fire, uh, but... Uh, Um, it is hard to believe that uh, uh, genetics could go into it so much, but um, at least the main character gets to fulfill it, and that, that seems sort of nice after all the trouble he's gone to, h 5 Z T. Thank you, Ms. Carolyn. Next up on the list, PG5 WGH Nicholas, your comments on characterization. Uh, yeah, I thought uh, we, we missed uh, quite a bit of opportunity to build out our, our main character there. We started out pretty good with Ms. Young, and the kind of showing the story from birth and part of the childhood and stuff with the brother there. Uh, and then all of a sudden we jumped uh, way forward and suddenly he's the best guy there. He's going to be on the ship for, for the once-in-a-lifetime thing. I mean, we know he's got the great genetics with, from the actual drone, but so did everybody else in that room. So I felt like we could have uh, seen a little more uh, character building than that of what made him so great, what made him so qualified, how did he beat these other people out. Maybe they could have showed some challenge there where he saw something that no one else did. I, I just felt like we kind of... Uh, this is an engagement point with the character of why we should really uh, be 
either, uh, you know, work for him or maybe not, depending on how you see him as other dimensions of other people or that idea or whatever. Just, you miss an engagement point there, I feel like. Uh, and then his brother, uh, I don't know what they were doing with the brother, because I feel like he could have just been the one memory top that we thought that he re-engaged with him throughout the beginning and at the end. It just seemed like a lot of uh, extra hand-waving and, and time-waving. I didn't feel like it, it really, uh, there was enough depth to that character to really add a lot other than his, 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 uh, the main character struggle with his perfect brother figure. Um, uh, and then Irene, she was uh, seemingly totally flat to me. I just didn't, I uh, felt like they could have uh, gotten a little more, done something with her. Then uh, I, I thought uh, some of our, our side characters uh, didn't really, uh, they seemed a little broken. Uh, for some reason, I kind of expected the uh, Ernest Brunette character to be uh, uh, a problem point in the plot. I thought he might be going to uh, uh, kind of oust our, our main character there, uh, but he seemed to just be completely oblivious. And I thought maybe they had him there as the manager, as the cleaning man, and attention to detail on those kinds of things, but maybe he was going to uh, know something about it. So I felt like they kind of missed a, an opportunity to introduce the conflict and the, and the plot there by leveraging that character. I guess that's all I have on the characterization. Back to that, 55 and GH. Thank you, Nick. Uh, share thoughts on that one as well, uh, as far as uh, wasted characters, uh, wasted actors. Uh, KFX TSK, Burl, your thoughts on characterization? That's KFI TSK. I have you know, two observations that really, I, I guess, relate to uh, characters that, no, there were no computers, uh, no TV, no telephone. Um, and, and I think the thing about Vincent is they were expecting him to um, do the navigation, uh, I would say, in his head. It, it's like, uh, you know, we don't allow well, these electronic things. You know, we're expecting people to do it. Um, you know, something else in the movie is there are no children, you know. Uh, yeah, these perfect people that's going to live to be, uh, uh, more than 100 years old, and it's just don't need that many people around, you know, the, these other people are not genetically perfect. Well, they'll, they'll you know, be born and die, and you know, we'll just hit someone else. Uh, that's all I have for that. Can't find two escape back to that. This is KE5ICX. I'm net control for tonight's Skype. Skynet. What are we doing? Oh, yes, after Bowie Net. Very good comment. That uh, short but sweet. Uh, where are the kids? Interesting. That's uh, EVB. David, you're next. Characterization. Uh, well, allow me to break the short but sweet trend. Um, let me go back to some of the things that were brought up. Uh, it's not about characters, but I'll get to characters. Wearing a suit in space. Well, the studio had a problem with that, too. Shouldn't they be in spacesuits? Well, the production team sent photos to Dr. Floyd from 2001, where he's shown in a suit aboard a Pan Am spaceship on his way to the moon. Yeah, he's just a passenger, but that shows that there really isn't a need for a spacesuit in routine manned space travel. And yes, 12 manned launches per, per day qualifies as routine. So after being shown that 2001 reference, the studio relented and said, okay, yeah, I guess that's acceptable and okay uh, uh, for a monkey-suited but not space-suited astronaut to, uh, to, to fly a spaceship. Now, as for the, the astronaut screening, I wouldn't laud NASA and their process too much. After all, the recent astronaut resigned after deciding he or she didn't like to fly. Shouldn't that be on the first questionnaire? Okay, characters. Vincent, Starry Starry Night, Don McLean, Van Gogh, living in a world he wasn't meant to be in. 
Van Gogh himself would have been an invalid, or my, more likely rejected in vitro as an unsuitable fertilized egg, having a genetic predilection for mental illness and epilepsy. Um, that Vincent had some guardian angels of sorts. The doctor, obviously, made known to Vincent near the end. Um, Ernest Borgnine was another. Uh, more in the background, meticulously cleaning up around Vincent's desk, Vincent's desk, trying to ensure no DNA-laden biomaterial was left behind. And in a telling scene, Ernest takes a used paper cup directly from Vincent in the stairwell. It's good to know, or even not to know, those who have got your back. And it's likely that Ernest, Ernest's character knew it was Vincent all along, but I don't think that Vincent knew that he knew. Now, we've also kind of discussed how, in genetic terms, the individual parts don't necessarily define the whole. In addition to the human spirit, there's no gene for empathy. Uh, Joseph, the new flight director, after murdering the old one. Or maybe the lack of empathy is considered a desirable trait in the future. I don't know. Nor is there a gene for suicidal tendencies. In Jerome's case, he failed the first attempt, succeeded the second attempt, and maybe on the next attempt, too. Um, but I don't know. Maybe that's also considered a desirable genetic trait in the future, but not in my present world. Um, let me reset. Danny DeVito was a producer uh, of this movie, and uh, he, in one of the featurettes, described that the final version of the film didn't include an epilogue uh, that included a list of prominent historical figures who wouldn't have been born in a Gattaca world. And those included Abraham Lincoln, Martin Syndrome, Emily Dickinson, Manic Depression, Vincent Van Gogh, Epilepsy, Albert Einstein, Dyslexia, John F. Kennedy, Addison's Disease, Ray Charles, Primary Glaucoma, Stephen Hawking, myotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, that was that was left out uh, of the uh, the final cut of the movie, but uh, interesting uh, illustration. 25 EBB. Interesting. Thank you, David. WB5OZL, Miss Brenda, are you still awake? I know you were fading today. Uh, your comments on characterization. This is telling me five O Z L. Yeah, I'd like to echo all the things David said. Uh, all the uh, so many creative geniuses um, would not have been born in that society. Um, and you know, there is some discussion of whether the flaws that some people have lead to creativity. I don't know. Um, you know, that's, that's another debate. Um, but you also think um, about how a person might be born maybe genetically perfect, but um, through uh, bad decisions, like maybe alcoholism or drug use, or uh, recklessness, that um, you would end up with a very imperfect body. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I, it, it, the director wasn't just, you know, I don't think he made any mistakes here. I think he gave us what he wanted us to see. So, the uh, whole idea of Well, dystopia is what he was trying to put out there. I don't think it's a mistake for him to make the people the way that he did. He's obviously trying to tell us something. Um, I'm very disturbed by just basic lack of dimension on these people. They weren't fun, they didn't laugh, they didn't read or, or sing. Uh, all the joy in life is just not there at all. And uh, uh, you wonder why this guy wanted to go into space. That does not look like much fun to me. But he was just uh, so intent on doing that. Okay, so I think, uh, I think I'll stop for now. So you'll be fine with now. Yes, thanks for that. Next up, KG5 
PM. Your thoughts on sisterization? This is KG5 PM, man. Um, I guess the director wanted us to believe that um, in the future that that's the way there everybody will be portrayed as being perfect and uh, walk around in a kind of a robotic-like trance and not interact much with each other. Um, thought the bright spot was. Uh, I thought injected a little humor in it was certain way Ernest Borgnine and his character. In his character, what the way he always acts, and with his characterization style, and um, thought Alan Arkin also brought uh, a lot of the brought out a lot of the additional human, more human-like characters to the to the plot. Um, I guess the ending when the guy uh, basically uh, cremates himself. I guess that that was meant to be. Um, so that he would not have any remains left and that the Jerome guy could, in his, uh, the wheelchair-bound guy's uh, mind, that the Jerome replacement would always be there, even though everybody at the end found out that he wasn't Jerome. Had you 5 p.m. in, back to the net. Thank you, James. Good point. KF5PDS, Miss Billy over in Sherman, your comments on characterization. Yeah, I definitely agree that, you know, there's that blandness with the characters, and that to me is totally intentional because they live in this very clinical society. Everything revolves around biological testing. So, Every interaction they have practically with everyone else is clinical first. You know, get that DNA sample, make sure they're valid. Check the sample, make sure they're valid, that they don't have any toxins or have them drinking or any, you know, the, you know, they have clean screening. So and then they go in for that fitness test. And so nearly every interaction they have with people is biological first. So. They, everyone has this clinical detachment from everyone else, and I think everyone is so afraid of sharing information with each other for fear that they say something wrong or do something wrong and that gets them tossed out or you know causes their puts them in jeopardy in some way. And of course, you know Vincent slash Jerome, you know he definitely has to be careful of that because if he accidentally lets something slip. Uh, through, you know, just an unconscious slip, you know, it could cost him everything he's worked for. So he definitely does want to share extra information with people. So uh, to me it kind of reminds me of another dystopian flick, which would be a good one to do, called Equilibrium, except the people in that movie are medicated to medicate emotions. Um, and here um, it gets even sadder because they don't need the medication to eradicate their emotions it's already done by you know the all this biological testing and to ensure that people are creating perfectly you know biologically perfect kids it's putting so much pressure on people it's just the pressure to kill all kind of enthusiasm and wonder in people and to me that's even sadder than medicating people to get rid of that um and you know the interaction between him, I didn't really care for Emma Thurman's, char Thurman's character at all. Um, to me, you know, her character was so blandly portrayed that there wasn't even the slightest bit of chemistry between her and Ethan Hawke's character. And Ethan Hawke is usually one, you know, he emoted properly, I thought, in in uh, places. You know, you can see his eyes welling up with tears in certain moments and things, but, and, but even so, he couldn't be overly emotional. Um, for fear of giving himself away. And one of my favorite actor, character actors that's in a lot of films uh, is Xander Berkeley, who played the, the clinician who was doing the urine sample testing and who ultimately knew that he was invalid but let him go through anyway because his son was also an invalid. 
and I just love the way he portrays his characters. You know, he, uh, you know, really does a good job in all the movies he's in. Um, but in this one particular, you know, he really was on the side of Vincent wanting him to pull through. And uh, but Vincent does kind of come across as an anti-hero because he doesn't really care whether his heart condition gets in the way of the mission and jeopardizes everyone else. It's like, you know, come heck or high water, he's going to go to space. You know, that's just his be-all and all, and it's all about him getting there. And I think he just wants to escape the world, you know, get as far away from everyone that has tried to, you know, put him down or hold him back. He just wants to get as far away from everybody as possible. That's why he says, you know, he doesn't know what Titan's like. You think he would have researched every nuance of that mission and knew and studied up on Titan and would have found out everything about the world he was traveling to, but he says, I don't know what it's like. And so it's like, to me, he doesn't really care about what his destination is. It's just, you know, get me as far away from Earth as possible. Um, so it could have probably been anywhere, but maybe Titan was the furthest that he could get at the time. And that's maybe why he opted to, you know, be the navigator and, you know, for that mission is just he just wanted to escape. So that's what I took from that. Um, and I'm not really thinking of anything else, so I will return it to you. This is KF5's PDF back to Matt. Thank you, Billy. Interesting comments as well. KT5 is Ed and Jay. Zombies need jobs. Frank, your comments about characterization. KG5 Z and J. Zombies do need jobs. It's important. Um it's really tough to talk about the characters in this one because uh they were all hollow and morose and gray and lifeless. And uh it's not that they were bad actors, there were a lot of them were name actors, so uh I can only conclude that the director just beat it out of them, you know. Just kept telling them, Baby, tone it down, man, tone it down, you know, a like, hundred takes later just beat it out of them. That's, that's what I think happened. And, uh, I don't know. It's like, you know, setting yourself up thinking you're going to go to a really good restaurant, have this amazing meal, and uh, you get a Swanson TV dinner from the 70s, you know? So I I don't know. I mean, all the characters were exactly the same. The one who had any life was uh, Ernest Borgnine. So, uh, you know, and, and, you know, they didn't go past him. He, he must have just walked by and said, Hey guys, you got a part for me? You know, and he probably just uh, made himself a real pain in the butt until they, they just gave in or something. I don't know. Who knows? Um, but yeah, it, 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 one thing I noticed um, the only guys who had the spacesuits, like the jumpsuits, were the janitors. I mean, those are the guys who should have been going in the rocket, right? I mean, I don't know what they were thinking, man. Um, I don't know, you know, and then and, and the thing when. Uh, the guy in the chair, I thought he was getting in the big dishwasher, and I, I didn't expect him to, to light up on fire. And, uh, that was actually really disturbing. That, that was disturbing. And, uh, it just made me think, you know, I hope, I hope the next one we've got uh, little green men and laser guns and hyperdrives. Uh, that's all I got. KG5 in the Thank you, Frank. And uh, well, you know, I get this this one. I'll tell you this on on uh, picking this movie. What what I do is I go trolling for streams, uh, films that may be available commercially, uh, legitimately, um, either uh, well, multiple methods. And this one bubbled up to the top. It was available. I think it was Vimeo. And so I thought, well, I just put it on there. And I don't try and get totally into the film in the sense that I don't know what we're going to be watching in some cases. A lot of times the movies aren't those that I've, I've seen or reviewed or anything. So this was one I had not seen. But I took a chance. It had some uh, good, good reviews. And I just put it in the queue, and that's what ended up. So, yeah. You never know. Sometimes the films are quite surprising because I hadn't seen it and 
put it on the list. Okay, my comments on this one. Uh, oh, and by the way, we're probably going to reset. Let me reset. Oh, uh, the building. And that's the reason why I did is, is that now we're on three minute uh, time limit, so you may set the uh, repeater off at this point since we are now at 12 o'clock, even though the repeater's off by about two minutes. But I just thought I'd mention that, so you may want to break up your conversations uh, going forward. I thought the, 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 the characters in here, I agree with everybody. I'm not going to repeat it. Yeah, they were flat. I thought it was quite amazing that you had people like Ernst Borgheim, who, who was a character. Actually, he had played a, a, uh, uh, a, a character that uh, was uh, a, a substandard of sense. I can't remember what it was now. Uh, I'm sure you, the folks are, are shouting at me and saying that they remember, but it was... Uh, uh, a character, a uh, 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 learning challenge character. Alan Arkin went in it, and he didn't really, not much, which is a surprise. He's a great act, well, a great comedian, actually. Uh, and, and his series right now, you know, you've got Uma Thurman, she's coming off of some uh, major, major uh, shows, uh, movies, Gore Vidal, of course, rather. And uh, who else was in this thing? Um, Gorba, uh, who did this? Or someone else? Tony Shabab. Yeah, I am. In any case, all these people, they're A-list actors in this film, and, and as somebody mentioned, getting, getting uh, any sort of, uh, you know, acting out of them has beat them down, which is quite interesting. But I think that's the whole point of the thing. I think uh, there was mention about Masterpiece Society and, and uh, Next Generation in that. Uh, what happens is there's decadence, there's a revision, uh, a, 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 a uh, inner uh, uh, dep deprecation that goes on, and I think that's why you got kind of the retro look along the way, plus it's kind of cool. But it, it just kind of ends. It just uh, people start looking in upon themselves and and not outward, and as such, then the characterization starts to to fail. And I think that was part of the means to to the film. So any sort of expression that goes on is dramatic and and different, uh, and not acceptable really when you think about it. Uh, that's not the way this all works out. Everybody's perfect. It's, I'll make this as a side comment because I noticed it today when I went to lunch. Um, I sat down at the table and a bunch of us were there uh, sitting around eating. And uh, we, after a lecture and lab, at the table next to us was a family of four. Uh, they were um, uh, some folks. I, I, it, 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 the way they were dressed, the way they looked, they were... Uh, you know, uh, that upscale group of folks uh, wearing golfing attire type of thing. And the four of them were sitting across. There was a father and the three sons. And none of them talked to each other. They were all staring at their phones. They were all perfectly dressed, immaculate. Everything was perfect except for one thing. They weren't talking to one another. And that reminded me of this film to a certain extent and the conversation. So it, it does, that construct happens. Uh, it, it's all about what we look like, what we think we should be, what we desire to be, what we think is the ultimate. And then in the end, there's no, there's no payoff. There's nothing there. There's no interaction. I'm sure when these people go home, nothing else happens there either. There's no, you know, uh, leave the fever moment, that's too messy. So I think that that was kind of an interesting uh, 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 thing to me as an observer watching what wasn't going on. All right, this is KE by the ICX. I'm going to go ahead and open it up. Anybody who's out there that has any additional comments this evening, uh, please come down with your call sign. Anything at all, uh, even if you're not checked in, I'll take, take them now. Please come down.
five EBB. KF five TSK. Five BB. MT five TF. Is it L.A.? I think it's L.A. 
Um, next up, KFITSK. Uh, Bro, your comments. This is PSK. I would say that looking at the movie, I would not have had to go see it. You know, if it had been on TV, I mean, it would have been the worst movie there ever was on TV. And they paid the money. The money went to the actors. I mean, they spent very little on, uh, uh, you know, they showed a rocket, and it's kind of like, well, it was 1950s type, uh, you know, rocket ship, you know, going to this planet. I mean, they spent absolutely nothing on, uh, uh, I would say, Sid or uh, graphics or anything. I mean, the, the graphics were clear, but it, uh, you know, for some movies, it's, it's like, you know, they really spend money to really uh, blow something up, but, you know, everything was almost kitty animation. Uh, can't find PSK back to that. You do realize that the BFR that is built is being built by Elon Musk looks like a 1950 rocket. Just saying, just saying. N5BB, Bill, your final comments. Go ahead. Thank you, Tom. This is N5BB. I agree with Bill. I don't know how they spent this much moon, money on the movie. Um. You know, there weren't any special effects, really. Uh, you didn't see any space-related things. You didn't see them preparing for space. The only thing you saw them do was on the treadmills. That was the only thing they did. What did they do every day preparing to go into space? Just get on a treadmill. It, they didn't go and do anything. They didn't... You didn't see them, you know, in any kind of space-related thing. You didn't see him in the classroom. I don't know. I didn't understand that at all. Anyway, um, did I imagine something? Or was Alan Arkin wearing this long raincoat? And didn't he kind of act like Columbo, Peter Falk? I mean, Alan Arkin, Arkin played a little bit the, not exactly bumbling, but the, the single-minded detective. He's going to get the bad guy. He's going to get him. He's not going to give up. He's going to make everybody else stop what they're doing. He's going to get the bad guy. That's all he's going to do. And it, if I remember correctly, he's dressed in this long raincoat-looking thing, which I thought was kind of stupid. He stood out from everybody else that was dressed in suits, except for Ernest Fortnite. Um, and what's the deal with a 12-fingered pianist? You know, they threw that in there for a reason. And they were trying to be very shocking about it, I guess. He throws out his glove, and she puts it on, and there's obviously an extra finger. And was that supposed to be somebody genetically engineered to purposely have 12 fingers? Or was it somebody that uh, was a regular person that happened to have 12 fingers that didn't? It wasn't clear to me what that was supposed to be. So I'd like to know if anybody else had any idea about the 12 finger PS. I think they threw that in there just because of shock value. I wish they talked about, you know, they didn't talk about genetic engineering. They didn't talk about in trying to prove things other than simply selection of, you know, selection of embryos, essentially, is all it was. So they weren't fixing diseases. <laughs> that was the other thing. There's nothing they were doing medical-wise to fix diseases or anything. You'd think they'd do that with all that genetic information. Good night, in 5 BB. Oh, I'm sorry. Are we in rotation or are we just throwing it out there? I misunderstood. 
replica prop forum, uh, rpfforums.com, and uh, they claim that uh, someone went through and found that 78 of the 178 episodes uh, include that that crystal. But my question is, do you remember ever seeing it, or is this just sort of a internet phenomenon or rig thing where people claim uh, they're big, you know, Star Trek fans and they've seen every episode a hundred times and they never saw it before? What do you think? W five E B B. Uh, KG5 ZNJ, I definitely never remembered it. Uh, and I did watch the series when it went out on TV way back when. Uh, and I pretty much watched every single one of them. I, I probably missed a couple, but uh, I used to uh, sit there and watch them. And, you know, it was one of the shows I always watched. And I had zero memory of that thing. It, it's really weird because everybody remembers this team. But uh, I, I, for whatever reason, I think it's because they do it subtly. Like, he, you know, it's just kind of there, and he's messing around with it while talking, but it doesn't, it, it does, he, you know, nobody acknowledges that, it, that it's even there. That's what's interesting about it. So it's not noticeable unless you're looking for it. Uh, KG5 ZNJ. Well, I've gone back and just randomly watched uh, a few episodes, uh, and it's in the majority of the ones that I've watched. Sometimes it's just, most often it's just sitting on the desk. Uh, now, it, it could be that it, it looks like it is a reflection because it's very near the outside window with the stars going past. And also, uh, there's a couple of vertical crystal-like statues where you could, your brain could process that as being a reflection off of that glass, black glass uh, desk in Picard's ready room. So I guess I don't have enough data to really know if this, uh, you know, exactly had to explain it because I don't have the memory context because I didn't watch it back in the day. Uh, but it may just be a brain uh, emission <laughs> or processing that, that makes people not see it, you know, or it's been CGI edited somehow to add it in the more recent versions. I don't know. <laughs> but it's an interesting, interesting uh, phenomenon, but I think I'm not going to pursue it much more. <laughs> W5EBB. In the episode I watched, I mean, he was he was definitely twirling around in his hands while he was talking and everything. So it it, it was not like at the edge or anything. It was it was right there. But it's it's just the fact that they don't acknowledge that it's there. And there's never a story about it. I guess it's just something that's just right there. And uh, I can't explain it, because I, I had no memory of it. And I used to watch that show all the time. So, uh, I don't know. It's one of those things, man. Uh, KG5, uh, ZNJ, 7-3s. Well, that's interesting. And uh, the thread initially started on that forum in 2015. Uh, apparently, they were doing research to try to figure out how they could uh, create a 3D model of it, and which is difficult with a reflective surface with lots of facets. You can't really tell what's on the inside, what's on the outside. Uh, but uh, and one of the initial uh, posts from 2013 was, let the madness begin. <laughs> so I guess they've achieved that goal. <laughs> but I'm going to stop it right there before it gets to that point. <laughs> it's a curiosity. Uh, but it would be interesting to hear from other hardcore uh, next generation fans uh, to see what they would have to say about it and what they recall, if you know any. But uh, otherwise... I'm going to leave it as is. But thanks for looking into it. Very interesting. W5EBB.